Good afternoon, everyone. This is Stuart Cohen. I'm the president of Nodeware. I want to thank you for attending our small medium business executive education series around cybersecurity. Uh, it is critically important with everything going on in the country with all of the ransomware attacks and all of the SMB business leaders uh, that are trying to figure out what to do, uh, that are trying to figure out how do they build an education program, how do they build a culture, how do they help their employees around cybersecurity. And we've launched a series of these sessions uh, over the next couple of months uh, with industry thought leaders and insights on what is happening around the SMB marketplace. Um, with that, you know, I'd like to thank Todd Fitzgerald. Uh, Todd is the author of the CISO Compass book, has been a well-known CISO uh, at a number of Fortune 100 companies over the years, and has been a tremendous kind of insights and thought leader around cybersecurity both for large businesses and for small businesses. And we are fortunate enough to have Todd Fitzgerald with us today. Uh, I got the opportunity to meet Tony Sager uh, a number of months ago. Um, I was told he was the father of vulnerability management. And before I joined uh, Nodeware and IGI, I should talk to Tony Sager about what he thinks, what he knows, and what small businesses should be thinking about as it relates to vulnerability management considering so many of them have never done anything in this particular area. So we are honored uh, to have both of them here today to talk a little bit about governance and what SMB's executives can do to take a few simple steps uh, around governance specifically. So with that, I will turn it over to the two of them uh, to get started. And then uh, I also want to let you know that we've got a couple of questions um, that we'll present in the way of polls. Uh, also, there's an opportunity for you to submit questions, so please put them in the question box or the chat box, and it will give us the ability to uh, move on from there. We'll address as many of your questions as we can, and we'll follow up with any of the questions uh, at the end of the session if we don't get there. So with that, um, Krista, any other housekeeping issues that you want to mention before we get started? Thank you, Stuart, and thank you everyone for attending, for spending your time with us today. We are honored to be able to share Todd and Tony's uh, expertise and advice to help SMBs to navigate uh, navigate the landscape here as cyber attacks are increasing and uh, security is becoming more and more important. I wanted to make sure everyone's aware that you can see the upcoming events in this series, which is really all geared towards small and mid-sized businesses by going to the Nodeware website. If you click on About and go to SMB Events, you can see the upcoming events. We're doing this one today. We also have one next Tuesday on how SMBs can obtain cyber insurance. And then uh, also you can get social, engage with each other, interact, see who is all in this webinar uh, through the LinkedIn event. And then you can, we'll post the replays uh, into these event websites. So do check back, stay engaged, and really uh, continue to join us throughout this series. I did post the links to the next event, which I'd love for everyone to just take one minute right now, go and register so you have that on your calendar. It is next Tuesday. If you miss it, again, if you register, you will get the replay and you can also introduce yourself. You can ask questions. We'd love to hear what kind of speakers and topics you'd like to see in future events. So please do uh, engage, share what you'd like to see and um, reach out to us if you have any questions, we're here for you. So thank you for being here. That is the last of the housekeeping and I will turn it over to Todd. Well, thanks, Krista. Uh, you, you know, the, the one thing about not having sound on the video is that it really doesn't matter because you have Tony here. <laughs> uh, and Tony is the expert around the CIS controls, uh, which we will get into, which I think are just a phenomenal uh, set of work. Um, there's there's four different ways uh, to to develop a security strategy. 
uh, the, I mean, I'm sure there's more than four, but I, I, as I was researching this for the CISO Compass book, I came up with these four different ways that I see that most organizations really develop uh, a security strategy. Um, so if we flip to the first uh, slide, next slide there, please. Um, this first one is what I call the incident-driven strategy. And this is where an incident occurs, and so we need to do something really quick, so we make some short-term investment, and then the cycle repeats itself. Uh, and we do this over and over again. And you, and you see this in, in companies that are, are very reactive in their security strategy, if you feel yourself in that, in that kind of mode. Security doesn't get the attention it needs until there's an incident, then there's an incident, then, then we solve that particular problem, and then we move on. Um, the next approach uh, is really the uh, top-down approach. On the next slide. And this approach is where we start off with a company vision. We look at the vision statements. What's the mission of the organization or the government? And we build initiatives to, to meet that mission uh, that end up into smaller and smaller projects that we can tackle. And you'll see this in a lot of large organizations start off with this kind of visioning, visioning approach. Um, and usually this is something that happens after an organization is a little bit more mature, that they'll start thinking about what are those different components. But when you're first starting out, usually don't see this approach being taken. And it, which brings us to the next approach, uh, approach number three. Uh, well, and, and all of these approaches uh, actually look at the uh, drive from the business strategy. But as we look at the next approach, number three, this is a bot more of a bottom-up approach. Uh, and this is where we're looking at that technical infrastructure that we have. And then we map that into control frameworks and configuration standards. And then we start to look at the audit findings and see, you know, how are we matching up and how are we meeting those audit findings that we have. Uh, and you know, and how do our vendor products play into this? And then eventually we end up with, oh, here's how we're here's how we're compliant with the laws and the regulations and the industry practices. But we're typically starting out at a place where we're looking at that technical infrastructure and then looking at the gaps on the on the way up. Uh, as we move to the next slide, this is what I call the sauce, toss a softball in the bushel basket unconscious approach. Uh, and, and this goes back to when I was a kid and I'd go to the carnival and they'd always have this thing where you, you threw the ball into the bushel basket and, and if you got them to stay in there, you got the big stuffed animal, right? Well, it was impossible to get these balls to stay in there. They just always bounced off. And this is where we just start buying tools and we just, we just apply a tool here and we apply a tool there without any real thought about how all this stuff really fits together. Um, and so every, every organization has a strategy, uh, whether it's a defined strategy, whether we've said, oh, we're going to do this top down or bottom up or toss a softball in a visual basket approach. So it's good to is just stop and think about, you know, what strategy are you employing in your organization when it comes to security? Because the place we want to move to is either that top down approach or the bottom up approach. And something that I think just plays so well into that bottom-up approach, um, you know, to, is, to, is a great starting point is on the next slide. And this is where I turn it over to the master, Tony. Um, with the pandemic, we were clearly in an incident-driven strategy. Uh, this is where we ended up with, uh, you know, we may have had this great strategy and all of a sudden people were, Having to having to have VPNs and do and support remote working and taxing the taxing the whole infrastructure and a lot of things kind of went out the window, um, and so we ended up with an incident driven strategy. But the next slide and this is where Tony comes in. Um, this is the CIS controls, which I think are are great for addressing that strategy. Tony, what are your thoughts on the CIS controls? Well, thanks, Todd. Appreciate the, uh, the, the handoff there, and your thinking on this as um, on the cyber businesses is really a, a business imperative, right, as opposed to a technology one. So, 
you know, I'm, I'm fast approaching 45 years now in the business, uh, as, as we used to say back in the government, uh, long before cyber was cool. And it was, you know, it was about technology, right? You know, could we invent the thing that would stop bad guys? You know, could, was there a sort of a magical invention or a you know, mathematically verifiable kernelized operating system, you know, that would prevent these kinds of problems? And by the way, back then, we didn't see these problems sort of broadly across the economy. Right? This was about governments fighting against governments. And it really got the narrow, you know, uh, what we call the national security fight. And today, and a lot of what you, you talk about in, uh, in this and in your other work, this is all about mainstream business. Cyber has gone mainstream, right? You can't, you can't hide from this. Every business in our economy has to deal with uh, sort of things large and small and uh, the impact of potential uh, you know, ransomware, identity theft, and so forth to their clients. So yeah, so this is all about, you know, the um, sort of what I, how, what do I figure out how to do? And so, uh, you know, that's really, let me just give you kind of a minute about the, well, I'll call the origin story of the CIS control. So I started in the mid seventies at the National Security Agency. And, you know, and I've always been, my whole career has been about finding vulnerabilities for the defense. So I'm one of those lonely souls, you know, long before we talked about uh, red teams and penetration testing and zero days and so forth. You know, on behalf of the U.S. government, we would hire a room full of wonks and we would uh, sort of attack our own systems while they were being designed and built. And preferably before the bad guys figured out how to attack them. And then if we saw a problem, well, we could take longer, spend more money and then build those problems out of before they became real life problems. And uh, well, that. You know, that, that world seems quaint by today's standards, right? No one has enough money or control of the environment or control of their supply chain. You can't isolate yourself from the environment. And uh, that became obvious to us also you know, in my work at NSA. I, if, I, if there was one unique thing about my career, it's that at least in, in my day, when I was sort of younger to mid, I got to see failure at very large scale. All the stuff that you know uh, the, the security testers did against the U.S. government, so we could test ourselves. Uh, being, I'm one of the few lifelong defenders who lived in an intelligence agency, so I got to watch how nations attack each other, which is fascinating, and how they attack us. And so, you know, this is all about uh, how do I translate lessons learned right into into some positive action. So it's great to find problems. You know, I spent a lifetime. Uh, this is the best job ever, by the way. You get to go find problems in other people's systems, tell them what they did wrong and then walk away with no responsibility to fix it. That is the best job ever in this business. And that's what I, I have. Think, and Tony, I think you supplied yeah. a whole army of auditors with, with things to look <laughs> at and, and show exactly. us some things that we were doing wrong that we had to fix. Yeah, and you know, and the, the, the challenge, it took me a while to kind of figure this out, right? So again, it's great work. You're around really smart, clever people. Uh, people thank you for what you do, right? They appreciate the cleverness of pointing out flaws, but you know, at some point as you grow up, it's not very satisfying to find the same problems over and over and over again. And my conclusion was, it's not that people are lazy or they don't care. It's that this is a not a theoretically hard problem as much as it is an operationally hard problem. But you have to you have to prioritize. You have to do things and buy things and so forth. So that, that all these lessons started to build up for me in, in my career. And I, I started a campaign to take guidance that we were developing for uh, the Defense Department and the U.S. government and uh, you know, sort of internally and release it to the public. And that was July of 2000, or I'm sorry, June of 2001. And that started this sort of like outreach from NSA. But in, it was sort of in the mid 2000s, about actually about 2008, I, I was observing, you know, we we're talking about small businesses today, but I was looking at very large, well-funded government agencies who were struggling with exactly the same problems. And it occurred to me, you know, we a lot of our early thinking in computer security was uh, Todd's number, I think it was two, right? Start from top down. Because that's kind of natural for government agencies. Have a mission statement, you know, sort of cascade your way down. And what I observed was many of them could never get to the actual work of implementation, partly because it was so complicated and partly because they couldn't prioritize. So what I, the, the, the origin story of what we now call the CIS controls was, I called into a room, uh, put around the table, you know, five friends, five of the smartest people I knew, who lived and breathed this kind of stuff. So uh, red team, blue team, you know, attacked other nations for a living, uh, watched other nations attack us. And my challenge to that group was, uh, no one leaves the room till, a, till we all agree on a small number of things that we think everybody should do to get started. Not to solve world hunger, not to solve peace in our time, because that's what security people do, right? 
if you give me a list of 50, I'll give you 25 more. If you give me 75, I'll give you another 25. Th those are never ending, right? And that keeps an army of auditors, as you said, John, going. I said, we need to help people prioritize and focus their attention on things that really matter. What are bad guys really doing today? Not, you know, folks like me grew up sort of great at speculating all the bad things that might happen. But it's really important to bring some focus to that and say, what is really happening? What is really costing us out there? And how do we translate it into action? And that, that meeting led to a two-page letter. And I never dreamed, you know, Stuart, I, I, I promise I'm not really the founder of uh, vulnerability management, but you know, I've been involved in this sort of translate, what I call the translation problem of a long time. Right? What, what have we learned? How do I translate it into positive action? And that was a two-page letter. I never dreamed it would turn into this big deal. Honest to goodness, I never, I, there's an old joke uh, for guys of my age, right? If, I, if I'd have known I was gonna live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Well, if I'd have known this was going to be a big deal, maybe I would have done it differently, but you know, that's not the way it worked out. But it was a two-page letter. We got picked up uh, by a think tank in D.C., by the Sands Institute and others, and turned into roughly what we know today as the controls. You know, lots of people worldwide, classes, posters, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so the idea resonates, and it wasn't because you see these great documents listed on your screen, like the NIST CSF, but this is not a replacement for those. This is a way to prioritize within those, right? Uh, many of you have to deal with some of these things uh, either legally or because you're a member of a supply chain or you're, in a, you're a regulated industry or whatever, and those don't go away. The challenge is how do I prioritize action within any one of those? So that's really what the controls are about. It's about prioritizing how do I get started in the most effective way, recognizing that I have to uh, maybe eventually deal with a regulator, an auditor, a judge, a lawyer, and so forth, right? Because those yeah, are just yeah, one part of how we manage the risk in society. Tony, Sorry, the one question that comes up is, you know, small businesses, they always get questions from their investors and from their board members, right, about what are we doing to make sure our business continuity is going in the right direction? And what are we doing our confidentiality and the integrity of our systems are going in the right direction with all these. And, you know, this is a CFO, a COO, a, a CEO who might have a part-time IT person or they rely sure. on a MSP to help them. You know, as it relates to the SIS 18, what are a couple of things that you would suggest they do right off the bat that could help them start to build that culture? And then, uh, and then I got another question for you that just come in the chat as well. Okay. Yeah, just a just, uh, quick summary. So some of this goes back to the uh, structures that Todd talked about, right? How do I get started? And I, I'd say we, as I watched cybersecurity, I'll call it, uh, I call it the transition from wizardry like, to business decision making. Uh, you know, we, we originally treated this as a language problem. If we could just teach executives to know more about technology, they'll be really smart and they'll make good decisions. Yeah, that, that hasn't happened. Or if we could just teach technologists to speak business then you know then they'll know how to sort of whisper to the executives and we need both of those right that that is a language barrier but that does not solve the problem and so you need a way to help people get focused in on how do i get started but also get started in a way that has a growth path and so that's what we try to do at cis again this is not a commercial but a couple of years ago we implemented what we call implementation groups which was even even might think of the the cis controls as a subset of the larger catalogs, right? If you're familiar with NIST 800-53 is shown on the slide. You know, that is the ultimate catalog of controls. That's all the things you could do to defend yourself, but you're not going to do them all. And NIST doesn't expect you to do them all, right? You're supposed to go through some sort of risk management process and choose the things that are really important. What I found was most folks can't do that. That's a struggle. They don't have enough threat information or the right people to make that kind of translation. And it turns out, most of what you find if you go through that process is sort of you have in common. So, you know, with, with many others like you of similar size and a similar industry. So why not, you might think of it as crowdsourced or why don't I share ideas with others and then figure out what we ought to do. So for small businesses, we put in place this sort of sub, so giant catalog, think of it as, you know, everything I could do. Think of CIS controls as a, as a uh, sort of reasoned subset based upon the observation of attacks. Then a subset of that, which we use as, we call it an on-ramp, or our term for it is basic cyber hygiene, you know, implementation group one. So the, the things that everybody should do, and it kind of bugged me a couple of years ago. You know, cyber hygiene became like a term that people used, and they would say, you know, you know what I mean, like 
like washing your hands, right? Like, you know, getting your shots. We should patch our systems and so forth. But there are a lot more examples of that than there are definitions. And my concern was if you don't have a definition, then you can't plan a campaign. You can't be very specific in building tools and education. So, so for me, it always comes down to get started on the basics. You know, and don't spend a year studying, but get to work. And we try to embody that at CIS in, um, uh, in our implementation groups. Now, back to Todd's language, Todd, you know, again, you, 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 um, and again, I really like your structure. I especially like you throwing the balls in the basket because I could never make that work either. But the idea is really important, right? You, you have to do some action, but you don't want to do it sort of independent of the need for, to be able to explain it to an auditor, for example, or to a regulator. Therefore, you need to have some structure to it. So when we produce so things like implementation groups, we will say, but this, this action that we recommend from CIS, this is how it maps to something in the NIST CSF. This is how it maps to 853. This is how it maps to CMMC and so forth, right? That allows you to say, okay, I'm gonna take a more technical kind of focused on-ramp approach, but I also know that eventually I'm gonna to have to report to a larger, kind of a larger entity here. So, so we do that mapping for you so that you don't have to do it. So Tony, what, one of the things that I, I really like is that you start off with um, the, the, the first, the first one of those CIS controls is being the asset inventory. Yeah. And, you know, we say it over and over and over time, uh, you know, that you can't protect what you, what you don't know, if you don't know what you have, right? You can't protect it. And, and every time I, you know, I pull up the CIS controls and see that is number one, it's, it's that constant reminder that that really is important to, to have a good asset inventory. And, and, and what are some of those other controls that you've got in the CIS controls that, that you think are just absolutely critical for small businesses? Yeah, that's a great question. And that, that, that sort of bundle of the first few things in the controls, you know, that's, that's deliberate, right? It's not literally a, a linear one through end list, but the, the early ones are really important. And for me, I mentioned we released the NSA security guides to the public in 2001. And so that led me out of the road to, to speak about it, right? And, and so people would say, hey, thanks for, for that, but what do I do first? And imagine my surprise, I wasn't prepared to answer that question because I never had responsibility to fix these problems. You know, I admitted that to you. And mm -hmm. what jumped into my brain was visibility, that most enterprises didn't even have basic visibility of what they owned. And I knew this would matter because of where I worked, right? That is. Lack of visibility is where nation state attackers go to hide. You know, that is, they, they will take the time to do the reconnaissance to figure out where they can hide and how they get into your upgrade path and all that. So visibility really mattered. But, but that was very closely followed by some other things, Todd, including things like configuration management. I, I mentioned, again, we, we released the NSA security guides to the public right before that time, and, and, and we did not, Again, we didn't have a, I've never had a big idea. We always have little ideas that turned into great ideas eventually. And so we'd started releasing the NSA security guides to the public uh, without really a grand plan. We just did it because I, I could see the boundary between sort of outside and inside disappearing. Therefore, you know, the Defense Department doesn't get better till its uh, supply chain gets better, for example. So how do we help them get better? And um, so I brought in the, the person who, who was responsible for the NSA security guides. And I said, what value can I tell people they get if they follow our advice. And he didn't have an answer, you know, which was kind of telling, right? It's good advice, no question. Very smart, experienced people, but it's the, it was based upon kind of the judgment call of a small group of people. And I might've got a different answer if I got to ask a different group. And I can tell you the as one thing. who used those guides, is, is a user of, of those guides, yeah. that, the, you know, the, the things like the configuration standards really help you build a set yeah. of baselines that then you have something that you can measure against. How, how far off is, are your systems from those baselines? Because most of us, you know, and, no, and I'm, I'm Todd, you're exactly, you, you nailed the next one on my list, by the way. Configuration management is the key uh, to, you know, because so many uh, activities of the attacker take advantage of the, the sort of the way you have set things up, right? The knobs and dials that, that really constitute configuration. And if you can effectively manage your configuration, then it implies you actually have pretty good visibility, right? You know what's running, you know what state it's in, you know when it goes out of a particular state. Mm -hmm. And so that is absolutely, that's why, you know, if you look at what 
we do at CIS. Right? We're the home of the CIS benchmarks, which are kind of the lower level of abstraction. You know, that's how do I configure a Windows desktop for best security or a mail server or a web server. We, we are the world's largest producer, not independent um, producer of that kind of information, right? Through volunteerism, we bring volunteers together. That gives you the baseline. And once you have a baseline, you're exactly right. That then you can do the, the sort of enterprise level things that you talked about manage measure set expectations right you know uh, correct when things change have a process to authorize when things are, are okay to change so so you the, the primary ones visibility configuration management i would say my kind of next on my list is around the management of its administrative privilege you know that is sort of knowing mm -hmm. and, and all these by the way these are have pretty good analogs and physical space you know, it would be an irresponsible small business owner that didn't have a pretty good idea of their inventory and who can, you know, what's in the warehouse and who has the ability to change the locks. You know, that kind of, you know, if you think of those, that actually holds up okay. You don't have to have perfect uh, visibility, for example. Uh, a lot of times I think perfection is the enemy of the good in security, right? We, we say, I can't do it perfectly in some security, old security guy like me tells you five exceptions and then you get paralyzed and you don't do anything. That's a huge mistake. And so you absolutely, you know, good is good enough for a huge number of yeah. cases of stopping attacks. And, and hey, I Tony, think that works really great to prevention. Go ahead, yeah. Stuart. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, you know, before I joined Nodeware, I had so many people tell me, you know, if I just knew what devices I had and which ones were exploitable and which ones were potentially at risk, I would be well ahead of the game. But I got to go figure out how to go do that you know, simply and easily, right? And it's amazing how big a challenge that is for people uh, and what they do. And we're actually gonna have Carrie Pearlson from the MIT Sloan School of Business. She's the Executive Director of Cybersecurity on in a couple of weeks. And one of the things she's gonna talk about is the Harvard Business Review study that she did around what a small businesses do to try and create just a little bit of culture around their executive team and their workforce to just try and be a little bit smarter, a little bit safer, understand what their assets are, what their vulnerabilities are. Um, and that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. We have a poll question that we want to launch for people in the audience. And while you're answering the question, you know, Todd, we got a question that's a little bit more big business, but I think it's an interesting question, which is, is it preferable to, to, pro is it preferable to combine the top down and bottom up approaches that we can set the strategic goals at the top and then assess the current state of the identity and what the gaps are, you know, and what would be needed to close those gaps. You know, is it preferable to kind of do that at a larger organization or are there better ways to identify the gaps and how to close them? Yeah, I, I mean, my belief is it, it's always better to start with the, with the top down if you can do that, um, if you have the resources to do that. Because in the end, what we really need to make sure of is that we're not just we're not just building the technical infrastructure, but that we're out actually serving the needs of the business. You know, what are those products and services that your organization really cares about? What are those things that are creating re that's creating revenue for your organization? What are those you know systems that they can't be afford to be without? Those are the important things that we need to make sure that we map into. The reason I say that a lot of organizations start from the bottom up is because that's where the pain is. And a lot of times the, the security officer will be sitting within the IT department. And so they become very technical IT things. And if we don't have, you know, for example, we don't know where our assets are, we don't know what that inventory is, um, then, it's, then it's very difficult uh, to be able to um, uh, you know, be able to to move the program forward into those into those business questions. Um, so, so I think both of those approaches are fine. Um, at some point, there there is going to be this top down sense of because we have to match up uh, in the organization. Um, yeah, so thank you, uh, guys. Todd, just I, 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 to. I want to. Oh, go ahead, Tom. And I, I did just want to oh. let everybody know the poll is open here. So as we're talking about getting started, we're also looking to get a baseline here and see what are the real challenges of the audience so that we can speak directly to those. But Tony, go ahead and add uh, your perspective there and, and just want to 
have everyone go ahead and answer the question. We've got about 41% who have voted so far. Yeah, very good. Now, I just wanted to echo uh, Todd's point. It was important. You, you know, a few of us get to start over from scratch, so you almost always wind up with some sort of hybrid approach. But you know, when you think about things that, like we talked about earlier, uh, knowing the assets that you have, there is certainly a technical uh, component to that, right? Having the technology to be able to detect things, track them, and manage them. But I think that, that you know, I've watched more security programs. This is my experience. Fail because of a lack of management controls or will or governance than technology. You know, if you look at ex examples like application whitelisting, uh, inventory management, control of, ex of installation of software, a lot of those are, yeah, there's, there's technology to them, but they often run counter culture within an organization or you, it has to change, it'll, you'll need to change the way you buy things or you assign responsibility for things or who reports to who. And those are all the things that Todd talked about earlier, which is this, need to manage and govern. And again, we've done some polls uh, for, for state and local governments, for example, that says, you know, sort of a key factor in security program success is executive involvement. If executives care, and they don't have to understand it perfectly by any means, but if they care, then they ask those kinds of questions that Todd talked about, right? And then you look at sort of a mix of technology and business process to allow you to answer those questions. And that's a really, I think, an important part of the, the um, uh, success in any good security program. Right. Yeah, it looks like we've got about 60% who have voted here in the first poll question, which is, as a leader in your organization, what is your greatest cybersecurity challenge? And it looks like, as I see it right now, budget justification for cybersecurity preparedness uh, is leading the pack here, closely followed by initial employee education. We'll keep this poll open just for um, maybe 30 more seconds uh, for anyone who's listening and not seeing the screen if you want to jump in and answer the poll. And then we will jump back into the conversation. The, the next question that we're going to go to just to give you a little heads up is Thinking about, as we were talking about this initial uh, foundational question of what is your attack surface, what all is out there, it's going to be about uh, are you doing vulnerability scanning? So we'll open that question up in just a few minutes, uh, but I will pass it back to you, Todd. And one of the, the something I, you know, as we go into vulnerability scanning, uh, it, it's something that in my opinion, every organization needs to be doing. And, and I will tell you, I have worked for some very large global organizations uh, that have surprised me that in some of the countries, they were not doing vulnerability scanning when I started. And, and I was just shocked at that. And I'm not talking years and years and decades ago. Um, so don't feel alone, I guess, is what I'm saying, if you're in this space as a small business, because there's a lot of large companies that are, are grappling with these issues as well that are, that are, you know, moving into the vulnerability scanning space because they see how critical that is. And areas or countries that may have been small in the past, maybe they just had some back office systems and they were, really weren't scanning or they had a small footprint. Um, they're scanning those devices now. And I think it's just critical. And I think of it this way, where Tony, you know, talked about, you know, how we have, we have to identify our assets, we have to have good configuration control. Um, vulnerability scanning really helps us to make sure that we're keeping the health of those, of those appliances in place. You know, think about that you, you go to your doctor every so often to get a physical, right? To see how well you're doing. Well, we need to be doing the same thing of our devices. We could assume, oh, I'll, I'll bet my numbers are good. I'll bet my lab work is fine because, you know, I've been eating good, so I must be okay. Well, we really don't know until we actually draw blood and, and, we, and we check, you know, what's, what's actually in those results. And I look at vulnerability scanning is the same way. Yeah, I'd agree, Todd. I think uh, the, the phrase I use is that, um, uh, cyber defense is like designing and operating a machine. It's not an event or an invention. You know, again, I, I talked about the early days of computer security, right? We would invent the technology that would make this problem sort of go away. Really what you're doing is you're building a machine, right? You're scanning. 
and by the way, humans take action, things change, you know, in the business context, mergers and acquisitions. I mean, everything is dynamic. And so what you're building is an ongoing information machine to sense what you have, sense when things are not what you think they ought to be and so forth. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. By putting in place some of the things that you talked about, now you start to get a sense for, why do I have blind spots? I know, you know, I, th this is complicated. Why, why are things popping up when I didn't expect it? Or what are the things I don't know anything about? That allows you to shift your management attention. Right? So if you wait for perfection of, I could, you know, I'm gonna scan every system, every whatever, you know. So we, if you scan too much, we call that a uh, self-denial of service, right? You bring down your own power, you create so much traffic. But, but that's part of the risk decision. And so you wanna do it credibly well enough it's sort of a machine discipline, right? You're doing things over and over again. You get better at it, preferably, right? You get feedback. Mm -hmm. so where are my blind spots? Let me try to address that with a different approach or process or technology. But that, that ability to do that, I think, it is, and by the way, it is complicated. There's no question, right? Multinationals with lots of, you know, uh, branches all over do struggle with that. And uh, But, you know, if you uh, sort of wait again for perfection, you never get there. But if you say, and if you think of it as a distributed enterprise, as opposed to I'm going to buy one tool that scans everything, a really worldwide complicated thing, or can I ask everyone to sort of scan and I bring results together, right? They're all imperfect, but this gives me the ability to spot you know, changes that are detrimental and so forth. I think that's, that's really important. Too. And, I, and I think the, the thing I've always seen too is that no matter how well you think the organization is about a, you know applying the patches and doing the right configuration, when you, when you first bring in the scanners uh, and you take a look under the hood, uh, you find things. And, and, and you actually want to find things because the, you know, that's what makes the organization better. And it's better to find those things uh, is part of a security function or an internal function than to have some external auditor find it or to you know, think of yourself as being in the chain somewhere in a third party risk management Right. So, you know, supply chain, and now they're asking, "Oh, can we scan your systems?" And 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 you say, "Well, okay, we we're pretty good about patch management and everything, but you've never scanned your systems." Um, there's a huge exposure that's that's coming there uh, because you're going to find things that you didn't you didn't know before. You know, with that, we're going to launch the next poll question. Um, but I'd also like you to think about, you know, as an executive at a small business, right? Do you think about do I, do I put documented policies in place or do I think about technical controls being implemented? You know, once I know what my vulnerabilities are, what my exposed assets are, you know, what do I do? Do I go documented processes? Do I go technical controls to get implemented? You know, if I only have limited time, limited dollars, limited people, skills, uh, what do I do and how do I rely on my MSP potentially to do it? Well, and I'll just uh, take a, a shot at that here. I think, you know, this is where this gets down into, you know, really knowing what the crown jewels are in your organization. And, and this doesn't have to be a complex exercise. Uh, this could be a, a survey of, of your, you know, each, each of your management uh, individuals and say, you know, what's most important to you? Uh, and find out where those things are and then find out what assets are supporting um, those revenue streams, and, and and go from there, and make that your priority. So, may you know if you can't patch everything to begin with, um, or you know you can't look at everything, start there. Start with those those key uh, prioritized systems, uh, and then monitor that, and monitor how well you're actually. You know, vulnerability scanning is is one side of the coin that tells you where the problems are, but then the other side is how quickly are you addressing those vulnerabilities? Yes, and thank you. I just want to let everyone know the poll is open. We'll keep it open for maybe another minute. We've got about 41% who have voted. So far, results look like 44% are continuously scanning. Um, 19% and these percentages are changing as more people answer, but um, 
the majority are continuously. Then we have once a month, which is the second most popular uh, than nights and weekends. So it looks like our group here is pretty cyber savvy, which I'm super excited to see. Uh, also want to make sure everyone, uh, while you're in here answering the poll, uh, feel free to ask a question in the Q&A as we will go into Q&A here shortly uh, as we move into some of the SMB governance uh, as we're wrapping up some of this conversation on the controls. Yeah, very good. I just wanted to uh, follow up from Todd's point about sort of uh, the business owners or the leaders understanding, you know, crown jewels or the most important things. That is absolutely on the money. And Again, we, we're not going to train the business leaders to be technology experts. That's, you know, that's not what their, their role is. But they should be able to identify things that are critical to the success of the business. You know, the kind of information that if lost or modified or uh, ransomware you know, held hostage uh, would really cause uh, uh, serious impacts upon the business, right? upon the reputation or the operation. And that's really where you want them to focus. Now. There's a big step after that, which is that Todd talked about the how, how, how does that translate to IT? Where does it go? Who, what physically has control of it, or where is it stored? Who has permission to look at? That's a that's a technology question, but it really should be driven by what what is the, the what is its importance to the business, and that's where we should focus. And I think more work needs to be done, kind of from the technology end, to help make that connection. But you're not going to ask the business leaders to sort of figure that out, right? That's a technology question. And it's it's fair. A business owner who can't deal with those kinds of risks to the success of the business, you know, it's probably got other problems in addition. And uh, mm -hmm. but that's that's what again uh, another example I call this mainstream, right? We're not gonna ask the business owner to, to sort of deeply dig into technology, but they absolutely need to understand the risk to their business, whether it's financial, reputational, mm -hmm. personnel, safety, all these kinds of things. And then the, the challenge for the technologist is to put what we know into, into that context, right? Because at the end of the day, to spend a lot of money on a security program is competing for other things like reputation, like safety, like improved capability to serve customers. And so it, that's the decision space where they're going to compete. And so, you know, it's not good enough to say the wizards told me to buy some more tech and put it into place. You know, that would make life easy, but it doesn't actually make any progress on, on problem sure. either. Sure. So I want to quickly flip into the uh, uh, seven critical factors for SMB security governance. And, and as I'm going through this, think about questions that you want answered, and we will we will answer those in our Q and A. Um, uh, when I was doing some the research to actually put the CISO Compass book together, which is a, a roadmap for security of all size organizations. Um, I didn't want to come up with, you know, Todd's framework. You know, we have enough frameworks out there, right? So I was looking at what is it that that makes an organization effective? Because that's really what we're trying to do as a security officer is we're trying to make our business of security, a business within a business, if you want to think of it that way. How do we become effective? And as I was doing this research, there, there's the 7S model that was developed by McKinsey and Associates back in 1980 by uh, Tom Peters, who's a well-known management guru. And, and what was happening at the time is consultants were going out to organizations and they said, well, if you get the structure of your organization right, then you'll meet your strategy. And they said, well, no, there's, there's other things that are equally as important. And so they came up with these seven things, strategy, structure, system, style, staff, skills, and shared values. And so these, these are all equally important. If we don't have any one of these, we will not meet our strategy, which in this case is our security strategy. So taking this and mapping it to cybersecurity, if we go to the next slide. So we can look at what are those issues that we deal with in each one of these different areas. So for strategy, as it is we're developing our cybersecurity strategy, we need to develop a vision and a strategy that, that meets with the business objectives, as we talked about earlier. And then that gets informed by the emerging technologies and trends. What's going on today? IoT, machine learning, AI, not just as a threat, but also how do we use that in cybersecurity to advance our program? So that informs our strategy. And then we move to the next bubble, which is structure. 
Um, and this is where we have all the discussions around where should the security officer report? What are those different functions that we have? And then we move to the next bubble, um, which is systems, which are not IT systems, but are those processes and routines that a security officer has at their, is their toolkit. So we look at risk, we look at likelihood and impact. We have the security control frameworks like the CIS controls. We have the NIST cybersecurity framework. We have ISO 27000. We can use all of those different control frameworks. And then a very important one that I put in here is leveraging incidents. We should be looking at every one of these incidents that comes out and, and read the reports, go deeper, find that report on what actually happened and say, hey, could this happen in my organization? And this can, this can help move your, your program forward. Find those small businesses that have been attacked or large businesses and see how they apply to your organization. Style, this is how we interact with the board and how do we talk to the board of directors. The next area is, is uh, skills and, or staff. And this is what I call multi-generational workforce dynamics. And this is where we need to look at two dimensions. We've got four different generations in the workforce. Well, guess what? We work differently. We have, we're brought up on different technology. We have, we have different goals, the way we work in teams or as individuals. There's differences in how we were, what was going on in the world when we were a teenager. But then there's also the personality differences, like the Myers-Briggs uh, assessments, for example. How are we personally wired? So we need to appreciate that and build our teams and also communicate our security message, taking that into account. And then the next piece we look at is skills. You know, what are those negotiating, you know, poli you know uh, uh, politics skills, the budgeting skills, the finance skills, all of those that we need, the technical skills. And then finally, we have shared values. And this is the glue that keeps everything together. These are the, you know, how we codify things with policies and procedures, laws and regulations, uh, and then the privacy laws, which we really need to be in tune with. So as we look at you know, this is kind of the job. And if you look at, you know, where do things go wrong, well, you can probably point to one of these bubbles and say, well, we had a great strategy on paper, but we just didn't have people with the right skills to implement it. Or we didn't really have it laid out in a framework that we could show management how we're increasing in our maturity. And so, and so we failed that way. Next slide. So this is just an example. So this is, you know, these are like different functions as we're looking at structure in an organization. These are all the different things we need to account for. And it doesn't mean that we need to do it ourselves. Maybe we have an MSSP do some of this. Maybe we do some of this internally. Um, but we need to go down this list and say, where is this being accounted for in our organization? And it doesn't have to rely on the security, be in the security department. It could be somewhere else in IT or in one of the business areas. Next. So Todd, just as you yeah. mentioned MSSPs, we do have our last poll question. I'm gonna go ahead and launch here while you speak um to the next slide but uh, this should be a very quick answer here so we'll just keep it up for one moment if you're away from your screen right now and just listening if you don't mind coming back answer one quick question which is are you currently using an msp a managed service provider or an mssp managed service security managed security service provider and then uh, go ahead yeah, and, I, and I'll just cover this next slide while, while you're answering that question, and then I'll show the slide. The, the point of this next slide really is we've been maturing and evolving the security officer role in organizations for the last 25 years. It feels like it's new because of all of the ransomware and things that we've had lately, and, and, and there's a lot of focus on it. But um, we've actually moved from this, you know, data center type, you know, IT centric approach into where, you know, then we had HIPAA and GLBA and PCI standards and everything came out that way. 
Uh, and then we moved into a risk-oriented view of looking at security because we can't secure everything. And then 2007, 2008, then when we think we had everything together, which we never really did, but history, we like to think that. Uh, then the iPhones and Facebook and, and everything else, social media came along. And so now we have more concerns. And now we're really in the space where it's the privacy and the data where CISO. And what do I mean by that? The, the, the security officer, and this is large and small organizations, need to understand where the information is, how it's being protected, and, and what laws and regulations you're being subject to. You know those three things? That's, that's a great place to, to really be seen as that business partner within your organization. And then I'll turn it back to you, Stuart. So I have interesting an observation from the poll, you know, almost uh, actually just a little over half the people that responded to the poll question about how often do they scan their network said it's either nights and weekends or once a month. And with all of the new devices coming on the networks and with people working in a hybrid environment and people plugging things into their own home Wi-Fi's and everything else, you know, do you think that's a big risk for where people are at in this hybrid workforce with not everybody controlled in their environment, in their network, in their offices. And maybe the two of you can comment on maybe how SIF 18 needs to accommodate something like that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just answer briefly. I, I, I do think it is a risk. Uh, you know, because, you know, this past year we've moved the footprint out further and further. And not only did we did we extend the the footprint, but we moved it into an environment that is that we know is not secure. You know, how ma how many home users have ever configured their router? Uh, you know, we're we're moving into those environments and and we're running on the same machines you know some people had to do things very quickly and so they're run on home machines where you have games that are running on those same machines and 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 so you know now i think we we start to pull back some of that that stuff and and make that make that more secure um i will say this too i think even in large organizations where the scanning you may not scan everything every every week, but you're scanning something, something that's different. You know, you may be scanning desktops, you know, at one point and you're scanning the servers at another point. Um, so we're scanning different uh, different things to, to find out those different, you know, where the holes are. But we should be thinking about scanning all the time. Uh, but doing, you know, not necessarily everything all the time. Tony, do you want to comment? And then uh, I'll make a few comments and then I'll give it back to the two of you to close things up. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, sometimes you'll see the phrase that the, the COVID year was an accelerant to trends that were underway, you know, remote work. Uh, sort of massive sharing, and I think a lot, in a lot of ways that resonates with me. You know, that as we move from you know policies about the control of data, right, what machine is it on, and what human beings, to like the policy now sort of has to go with the data. It has to be portable. Right? You know, it's, it's going to because there's no one place or or a fixed number of places where you can think about that. So, and I think it's causing us to rethink things like security policies and who has access and and make it clear, right, that. You, you, you go from this, I don't really know, to saying, well, maybe only these people need to have access to this information. Should I build a, a mechanism that enforces that and so forth? So, so I think in, in many ways, obviously, enterprises are, are rethinking a lot of what they do. And I don't think it's, it's going to stop anytime soon. I think it's exciting. And new technologies like 5G and network function virtualization and so forth give you the way to rethink the security architecture. So I think we're just starting on a really exciting adventure on rethinking some of these issues about control of data and management of privacy that, that Todd talked about. You know, to that point, you know, it was fascinating. We had uh, um, we had one of our advisory board members do a trial of Nodeware and they put the agent on their Windows laptop and of course they ran it at home and they realized not only were there a bunch of people on their home Wi-Fi, they didn't know who they were, but their printer, of course, was exploitable uh, as yeah. well as their home Wi-Fi was exploitable. 
And it wasn't that long ago, you know, you couldn't use your corporate laptop without being in your work environment and you couldn't attach it at home and you couldn't print anything at home because those were all vulnerability issues. And, you know, everything has changed in the hybrid remote environment and it rethinks all of those pieces. Um, with that point, you know, I just uh, briefly, we have a session coming up next week with Brian Hurd and Chuck Brooks talking specifically about how do small businesses get ready for cyber insurance? How do you fill out a questionnaire? How do you be prepared to start gathering that kind of data? And as I mentioned, Carrie Pearson from uh, the MIT School of Business will be on in a couple of weeks in July, talking about what small businesses can do to build a culture and what she's learned from her Harvard Business Review studies. So please sign up for those. Uh, with that, you know we've got a couple of minutes left, You know both Todd and Tony. Uh, why don't I turn it back to you for a second, you know, provide a few closing thoughts and a couple of things you would think people would suggest. And uh, this five stage evolution is probably a great uh, document to talk from uh, with your concluding remarks. Hey, Stuart, just before we do that, I think we answered most of the questions in the Q&A, but I did see this, um, this one at the end here. What advice can you give on prioritization of the found vulnerabilities and broken processes? So I don't know if that's something you can weave into your closing comments, Todd and Tony, that would be wonderful. Uh, could you repeat that question? I'm sorry, Krista, that missed a word in there. What advice can you give on the prioritization of the found vulnerabilities and broken processes? Yeah. The, uh, uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to defer uh, to Tony because I'd like to hear Tony's answer on that one. Well, the, the, in terms of prioritizing, so the, the, I'm sorry, I missed the found in the first. So the, the vulnerabilities that you find in the, the technically or in your processes. Uh, the, here's the way I would think of those, right? Is that almost any vulnerability that you find in a scan, don't think of it as sort of the, the, um, the sole problem. Think of it as a symptom of a problem. That is when you find this, like a, a missing patch. Right, you can go patch that, and the next time you scan, you'll find a different missing patch or a different missing patch. You know, the the problem is more about IT management, right? the the management of configurations across a, an enterprise. And so, don't don't get hung up in the I got to fix the one thing. Try to stand back from it and say, what is this a symptom of? It's almost always further up the life, the life cycle, like a bigger problem about management of IT. And so forth. That, that's just universally yeah. proved true. So and, and just to add on to that, to, just to add on to that, I, I think the you know what we've seen when you're measuring the metrics around the you know the vulnerabilities that are outstanding, always have to take that into account. What new ones came in that are that are the high priority yeah. ones? Because it can it can look like you're not making any progress in your security program when in fact you you you've tackled those and now you've got the next set. And and you could do more faster, but then that's that's the argument for resources, right? If you want to do more faster, then then you've got to be able to have more resources or more downtime. So I know we're coming to a close here, and this has been incredible. Um, just to add on to that, I'm sure that uh, as you learn more about Nodeware, you'll see we actually help in that prioritization as well in uh, prioritization the, or prioritizing the critical vulnerabilities. Uh, so continue with us uh, in this cybersecurity SMB series and join us for the next event. The link for the LinkedIn event is in the chat if you wanna scroll up and join that group. Ask any additional questions, suggest topics that you wanna hear from. We're really here to provide these as uh, thought leaders, these experts to share the information so that we can all raise the tides of cybersecurity amongst small and mid-sized businesses. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Tony, thank you for your time. Todd, it's been incredible to have you. Stuart, uh, any last words? No, thank you very much for your time. We're at the top of the hour, um, you know, cognizant of that. Um, as Krista said, you know, please let us know other topics, other speakers you're interested in, and we will continue those throughout this series. And Todd and Tony, once again, thank you very much for your time. I know we got some thoughts of some other things that we want to do together going forward in this series. And uh, I would just say stay tuned to uh, LinkedIn and stay tuned to our website for additional conversations.
thank everyone for your time and everybody have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.